Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. I'm Ron Richard, President and CEO of the Cleveland Foundation, and it is my honor to welcome you all to the 87th annual Annisfield Wolf Book Awards Ceremony. Whether you're here at the Maltz Performing Arts Center in Cleveland or tuning in from home, we're so pleased that you have joined us to be part of this very special presentation. I'd like to begin our ceremony this evening by thanking the many partners locally and nationally who make this event possible. Of course, I'd especially like to thank the esteemed members of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards jury who are themselves internationally known writers and scholars. Rita Dove, Joyce Carol Oates, Steven Pinker, Simon Shama, and last but of course not least, our jury chair, Henry Louis Gates Jr., who is <laughs> who is once again our MC for tonight's ceremony. Each year, the jury selects an exemplary group of authors to honor with awards in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and lifetime achievement. We look forward to celebrating the 87th class of winners tonight. It's been three years since we last gathered in person to celebrate the Innisfield Wolf Book Awards. It is also our first time hosting the ceremony at the Maltz Performing Arts Center. This building's rich history as the birthplace of Cleveland's historic Temple to Ferrith Israel congregation and now as Case Western Reserve University's Performing Arts Center in the heart of the city makes it a fitting setting for tonight's ceremony. Edith Innisfield Wolf, founder of the Innisfield Wolf Book Awards, was a Cleveland poet and philanthropist whose Jewish faith informed her charitable pursuits and her commitment to social justice. Her husband, Eugene Wolf, served as president of Tefereth Israel, and they lived just up the street on East Boulevard. The Cleveland Foundation is honored to steward Edith's vision, which aligns with our mission to enhance the lives of all greater Cleveland residents now and for generations to come. Today, many of the issues that Edith cared so deeply about, human creativity, diversity, equity, and justice, remain at the forefront of our societal conversations and the Foundation's mission and our work. The writers we will celebrate tonight are shaping these conversations, bridging our histories, our present moment, and our future. Our world is much better for their work. Before we present the awards, I'd like to welcome a very special guest to the stage. Each year, we invite a young poet from the community to read his or her work on stage at this ceremony. This evening, I'm delighted to welcome poet Kite Lynn, who is a fifth grade student at Cleveland Metropolitan School District's highly successful Campus International School. Kite will read a poem she wrote in fourth grade titled, My Dream for the World. Please join me in giving Kite a warm welcome. dream for the world, to sprinkle hopefulness around my school, to tumble my way out of the dark, to paint the bad out of everything, to sketch peace onto the world, then rewrite something someone did wrong. While the day comes, I'll create fun. While the night comes, I'll rewrite the stars to constellations, to kick away bullying, to splash nice comments, to rise goodness, to stop pollution, to clean my neighborhood and city, to clean wars that happened before, to reunite family and friends. This is my dream. Thank you. 
picture, so you get your picture. Yeah. Happy days. Congratulations to you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kite. What a really lovely poem. And we all hope your dream for the world comes true. Now it's my honor to introduce our distinguished MC for this evening's ceremony, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Skip Gates is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and founding director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. He is an Annisfeld Wolf Book Award winning author himself and the longtime chair of the Annisfeld Wolf jury. We're so grateful to Skip for his nearly 25 years of dedicated service to the Annisfeld Wolf Book Awards, and we are delighted that he is here with us again in Cleveland tonight. So now, as we're all anxious to get on with the show, please join me in welcoming our dear friend, Skip Gates, to the podium. Thank you. Give it up for Ron Richard, ladies and gentlemen, please. And even more energetically, give it up for Kite Lynn. <laughs> Kite Lynn's got Pulitzer Prize in poetry written all over her face. Good evening, Cleveland. Three years, it's been three years since we've been together. What y'all been doing? <laughs> three years, I can't believe it. And isn't it marvelous to be in this sacred, um, sacred space where the idea for Israel was born, for the, that Israel would be a nation that was born right here. Think about that. Think about that as we um, progress through the evening. Um, as head of the jury of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to this glorious ceremony after three long years away. These pandemic years have connected our world in countless ways, both bad ways and good ways. This disease has caused too many people too much pain and suffering, and the human community grieves those losses to families both here and the world over. The pandemic has also taught us more than I can tally here this evening. Our understanding of public health has deepened and our vocabularies have expanded. We've learned that so many things we did collectively and in person before, we can also do individually and on screens. But I'll take the collective and, and in person any day over um, the individual and on screen. Zoom is the worst word that I've learned in the last three years. <laughs> Which is why it's so good to be back with you here in Cleveland, one of my favorite cities in the world this evening. So give it up to Cleveland. In my nearly a quarter of a century actually hosting this event, I can't remember a time when the stakes were higher for education, for reading, and ladies and gentlemen, for books themselves. Local school boards have become one of the most fiery fronts in the culture wars that dominate discourse in this country. Classroom instruction is facing strictures and dictates that threaten to send us back to the middle of the 20th century, to the McCarthy era, and even earlier. Is it an accident that 50 years after the birth of black studies, which has achieved a broad and solid academic institutional presence, including the hallmarks of disciplinary arrivals, such as departmental status and PhD programs, precisely when multicultural literary studies and diasporic women's studies, gay studies, have never been more vibrant in the academy that the cultural and political right has 
undertaken a vigorous campaign to ban books that tell the complex story of slavery and caste and gender and race in American history? Is this an accident? Just as we must protect the right of every qualified American to vote, ladies and gentlemen, we must stand fast against all forms of censorship in all of its hideous forms. For censorship is to art as lynching is to justice. So to be with you this evening in Cleveland, where reading and books are part of the fabric of civic life, this week, of course, but also throughout the year, takes on a new significance. Thank you for sharing this time and this occasion with our great authors and prize recipients this evening. Give it up for them, please. I'm privileged each year to work with the best Book Award jury, jury ever assembled, Rita Dove, Joyce Carol Oates, Steven Pinker, and Simon Chama. Since they'll be watching this, give it up for them too, will you? <laughs> but finally, I also want to thank the Cleveland Foundation for its generous and steady support of this event. And two individuals in particular, Ron Richard, of course, the president and CEO of the foundation, and Karen Long. <laughs> Karen is the manager of the Annisfield Book Awards and the person who makes all of this, um, all of, of this happen, and she is um, a delight to work with. <laughs> I started to say, I was stumbling because a delight to work for, because <laughs> I work for her year round. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on to the awards. Um, our first award is for uh, the Anisfield Wolf Book Award for Poetry. Uh, Danica Kelly for the Renunciations. Poetry as reliving, as relief, as rebuilding. Danica Kelly's second volume the Renunciations, invites us to walk with her through a personal landscape that simultaneously is brutal and generative. In many ways, it reminds me of the first novel of Ohio's favorite daughter, The Bluest Eye by, of course, Toni Morrison. The Renunciations is the book of poetry Picola Breedlove would have written had she been able to write herself out of the abuse that she suffered as a child. The Renunciations depends on Danica Kelly's gift for polyvalence, to be present simultaneously in a moment and in the observation of that moment. The volume is separated into one introductory poem followed by six sections. The first three alternating between now, then, and now, with the fourth blurring now into then represented by a faded now, appended to a darkened then by an M dash, and the fifth and sixth now and after. Victoria Chang, last year's recipient of the Annisfield Book Award for Poetry, said in a review for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I quote, I felt brought along the process of the speaker's reckoning along a nonlinear and painful but also revelatory path, unquote, which I think captures Kelly's movements in time and space towards self-awareness and self-definition. I think it captures that process perfectly. Indeed, there's a, there is language throughout this collection that captures this non-linearity beautifully. Some of my favorites are the speaker's reference to herself early on as a carapace and as a palimpsest and later as a cycle fallow. The Renunciations captures the speaker's efforts to cast responsibility for the sexual abuse which she suffered as a child at the hands of her father. Away from her and onto 
the appropriate party or parties. If sexual, if sexual abuse is an assault on an individual body by another individual body, the responsibility for it also becomes communal. These lines from section two of Apologia stop me in my tracks. They also contain two instances of the empty bracketing that Kelly uses throughout the collection. And I quote, he is sorry for me, but he will not admit me to anyone outside this car. Not to my aunts or great aunts, nor to my grandfather or mother, who, though they believe any man capable, though they know what he has done, crowd into the space his denial makes. The renunciations tracks the speaker's nascently successful attempt to define herself as separate from the trauma and community that forged her. But as an ardent reader of 18th century writing, I was struck again and again by the epistolary choices Kelly made throughout the use of the form of writing letters. The inclusion of letters that largely consistent, consisted of blackened redacted words to an unidentified recipient. Like these letters, this collection of poems asserts that the I is always part of a communal entity, as much as it defines itself against that. Kelly's use of mythological and fairy tale imagery of labyrinths and towers, of the oracle in particular, points us also to the ways in which the communal enables us to understand the individual, because in the end, you can't have one without the other. The renunciations is Kelly's attempt to understand what came before in order to let it go, to unmoor the present from the trauma of the past. Renunciation is disowning. It is not denial. Kelly leaves, Kelly leaves us at the moment where she will begin to rebuild. And I quote, about time to get a hammer, I thought, about time to get a nail and Saul. Candor, resolve, resilience. This collection of poems, ladies and gentlemen, marks an arrival. Donika Kelly is a recipient of the Annisfield Book Award for Poetry for Renunciations. <laughs> That was maybe the scariest part of the publication process. Not writing the poems, but like thinking about them being published. I was like, people are gonna want to talk to me about their experiences, and I've just got a handle on mine, like, you know, barely recently. <laughs> but I think that that is the, the power of poetry and the power of literature is we can feel so close to someone, even if we don't know them, you know, that the work brings us closer to each other, and that feels important. I remember writing one poem when I was about 12 and uh, I showed it to my mom and she got kind of freaked out. I think the poem touched on some of the abuse that I was dealing with in some way. It scared her because it felt like it was giving her information that she didn't want. And so I just like ripped it up and like threw it away. I was like, oh, well, I don't want to upset my mom. Well, <laughs> you know, just something a little lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> no, I am, uh, I'm so, wow, there are so many of you. Uh, 
I am so honored to receive this year's Annisfield Wolf Book Award in poetry. Uh, I could not have imagined this. Um, I am deeply humbled and grateful to be in the company of the other winners of this year's award. More, to have my work welcomed into the lineage of the Annisfield Wolf Award winners feels tremendous. <laughs> like that, that big sublime feeling, it's to be connected, to be a part of is amazing. Um, and it's a delight to be here tonight with you in Cleveland, uh, a city I have not been to before, but that I hope to return to again and again. Y'all, this is great. <laughs> uh, when I was writing the poems for the Renunciations, I was trying to find my way out of a story that I had been telling myself about myself for almost my whole life. Um, to explain why my dad abused me when I was a kid. Um, the story I told was simple and familiar, uh, that I was unworthy of love, that I was unworthy of safety, that I had done something to bring that to me, bring his behavior to me. I knew the story was untrue. I knew almost from the beginning that it wasn't true, uh, but knowing is not enough. I was enthralled to narrative's power to foreclose, to end, to mark. Writing the renunciations helped me disrupt that story. I love poetry because it resists narrative. It can upend narrative. It can sort of ask us to look at things in a different way. And I turned to, to poems which I understand as excavators, those spaces of inquiry and curiosity that I might orient myself more truly to my own life. These poems are not a recounting of abuse. That's, that wasn't the project of the book, to just tell the story. Um, they are a golden thread the speaker follows out of the labyrinth of that old story. The father, in the renunciations, is neither monster nor god. He is no flat signifier, but a man who was once a boy with his own deep and painful trauma history. He is a black man who, though he occupies the center of the speaker's life, is a terror there, can and does fall victim to the extrajudicial violence of the state. He is a man who made a choice. Alongside those poems about childhood sexual abuse and the father runs the unraveling of the speaker's marriage. There's really nothing like that juxtaposition to put divorce into context. <laughs> I was like, is this the saddest thing? Uh, <laughs> the speaker has been complicit at putting another person at the center of her life, and now that person wants to leave, is leaving. The journey here is in the letting go, in the speaker realizing she is worthy enough to be at the center of her own life. It's a less complicated maze, to be sure. Throughout the collection, I've tried for tenderness, tenderness for myself, my speaker, and those who do me the great honor of reading my work. The speaker, <laughs> I have a small spoiler, and uh, Professor Gates has already given it away as well. The speaker survives, <laughs> which I think matters. Um, She emerges from that labyrinth, from that foreclosed story, and the future is, at least in some way, and perhaps for the first time, open for her. The girl I once was could not have imagined anyone caring about her experiences. I am grateful to the golden light of poetry, to you here tonight, to the jurors of the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, which reassures those of us who have survived, um, those of us who may one day flourish, that we are not alone, that we are worthy. I'm gonna read a poem, um, and it is, uh, there is some mention of domestic violence and police violence in this poem, so I'm just letting you know that. From the Catalog of Cruelty. Once, I slapped my sister with the back of my hand. We were so small, but I wanted to know how it felt. 
my hand raised high across the opposite shoulder, slicing down like a trapeze. Her face caught my hand. I'd slapped her in our yellow room with circus animals on the curtains. I don't remember how it felt. I was a rough child. I said no. I said these are my things. I was speaking usually of my socks. <laughs> White, athletic, thin, and already gray on the bottom, never where I'd left them. I was speaking of my fists raining down on my brother's back, my sister's socks. In the fourth grade in California, I kicked Charles in the testicles. I know, I feel so bad. At that school, we played sock ball hit the red playground ball with the sides of our hands and ran the bases. I kicked Charles with the top of my foot, caught him in the hinge of ankle. I wanted to see what would happen. I didn't believe anything could hurt like it did on TV. Charles folded in half at the crease of his waist. My God, I was a rough child, but I believed Charles that my foot turned him to paper. Later, I kicked my dad the same way, but he did not crumple. It was summer in Arkansas. What humidity, these children full of water. I hit him also with the frying pan. I hit him also with the guitar. We laughed later. Where had the guitar come from? My dad was a star collapsing. The first thing a dying star does is swell, swallows whatever is near. He tried to take us into his body, which was the house the police entered. This is how I knew he was dying. I'd called the police. What is your name? He tried to put us through the walls of the house the police entered, which was his body. What is your name? Compromised. The integrity of a body contracting. What is your name, sir? He answered, Kronos. He answered, I'm hungry. He answered, a god long dead. He threw up all his children right there on the carpet. After all, we were so small, the children. The thing about a star collapsing is that it knows neither that it is a star nor in collapse. Everything is stardust, everything essential. What is your name? Everything is resisting arrest. Its gravity crushes the children in the cruiser's rear passenger window. The officer didn't know the star's name. White dwarf, black hole, to see. Throw the collapsing star face first into anything. Face first into the back seat, face first into the pepper spray, face first onto the precinct lawn. Did you know you could throw a star? Do you understand gravity, its weaknesses? You are in my house. You should already know my name. Thank you. Yeah, you want a picture? Danica Kelly, everyone. Percival Everett, The Trees, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction. Percival Everett's The Trees is a novel about, among other things, the history of lynching in this country. It's also a novel that is very, very funny. Absurdist, satiric, and just plain laugh out loud funny. One critic, Sandeep Sandhu of the Cleveland Review of Books, rightly said that the book has echoes of mumbo jumbo by Ishmael Reed, who we'll get to later. Like Reed's classic novel, The Trees had me laughing out loud more than once. Sometimes, just with tossed stuff off lines, such as this exchange between the two detectives from the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation. I can't help it if I exude charm. Well, do me and yourself and maybe Dixie there a favor and try not to do so much exuding. <laughs> Another example, it's difficult not to chuckle when first encountering the name of the Acme Cadaver Company of Chicago <laughs> later in the book. 
Then there are the moments of laughing, though you know better, that you shouldn't uh, laugh, as in the, the white sheriff's view of a cross burning in the now of the novel, 2018, and I quote, Red Jetty, the sheriff, pulled over and turned off the engine of his squad car. He was on the Tallahatchie Bridge. From there, he could see the burning cross. The flames sent black smoke into the dusk sky. Even from that distance, the cross looked sad, not for political or social reasons, but because it was so obviously poorly constructed. <laughs> the cross beam was already collapsing, and the flames lost all enthusiasm. Lapped at the air, lapped at the air around as if exhausted. All the kerosene in the county wasn't going to keep that fire burning. <laughs> in the trees, anti black racism in the South is alive, but not necessarily well. It can't contend with the historical and supernatural forces that the novel will bring to bear on it. Here's a basic synopsis of the book. When two white men are murdered in Money, Mississippi, and the culprit seems to be a dead black man who appears at and then disappears from both of these crime scenes, two black detectives arrive to investigate. The dead black disappearing suspect looks like no one so much as Emmett Till. Another death at which this disappearing figure is present is that of Granny C. Carolyn Bryant Donham, the white woman who made the charge that led to Emmett Till's lynching. More dead racists and more disappearing lynch suspects crop up around the country, and the FBI is called in to take over the investigation. All the while, Mama Z, a 105-year-old black archivist in money, continues to do the work of documenting every lynching that occurred in the United States since the year of her birth, 1913. While Everett deploys satire to challenge the institutions that have so viciously circumscribed black lives, the work of Mama Z breaks from the novel's absurdist forays into local politics, detective work, and the grotesque industry surrounding black death. The deadly serious stakes of the novel are nowhere more evident than when the historian Damon Truff writes out a list of nearly 300 names of lynching victims from Mama Z's files, finally casting off his pose of academic objectivity as he confronts the human life that literally grounds his research. The latest of Everett's more than 20 novels, The Trees blends multiple genres, including detective fiction, Southern Gothic, horror, and historical fiction. It also takes a swipe at academic historians. With its inept racist and its transcendent black zombie Avengers who rise around the country, the trees presents a hopeful landscape where justice will finally be served to the purveyors of massive black death. But of course, this is also a fantasy landscape. So it's a qualified hopefulness at best. What the critic Mary F. Corey calls a radical imagining that can bridge the gap between history and fantasy. Everett is notably resistant to dissecting his own work, but in light of where we are as a nation with regard to reading and books, I'd like to end here with something that he said in an interview accompanying the trees being long listed for the 2022 Booker Prize, and I quote, there's a reason that oppressive regimes often resort to burning books. No one can control what minds do when reading. It is entirely private. We make of literature what we need to make. This is true of art. This is why the fascist right-wingers, he continues, are so invested in a populace that is undereducated. There is nothing more challenging, he concludes, to an oppressive government than a populace that can read and therefore think. The trees makes us laugh along the way, 
but its work of investigating United States history and injustice is deadly serious, ladies and gentlemen. For this significant achievement, Percival Everett is the recipient of this year's Annis Field Wolf Book Award for Fiction. In the book, I have a list of names to, that gives an idea that, that the names go on, a list of the victims of, of lynching and, and, and our culture in the United States. And like the character Damon in the novel, I did handwrite all of them until my hand cramped and I kept going. But it wasn't the cramping that, that was so meaningful. It was the sheer volume of people in the room with me. After the first scene, I actually turned to my wife and said, you know, I'm not being very fair to white people in this, this novel. And then I said, well, screw that. that that's the way it's going to be. Um, it's essentially a how do you like it. Growing up in this culture, watching representations of, of, of African-American people that persist, um, that are not fair, I just decided to turn the tables a little. Right, there are a lot of you. Um, thank you. Um, it, it's 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 nice to have the work recognized, especially for this award, um, and especially this panel of judges. And it's it's great to be uh, here with these other wonderful writers. It's it's terrible to have to follow Danica <laughs> and Kite Lynn. Um, and I'll, I'll do my best. I wish I hadn't had to write this book. Um, uh, uh, but I, I, we live in, I, the United States has never failed to let me down. Um, and a few years ago, I wrote this book just before the pandemic and before the, the, the summer of protests following uh, George Floyd's uh, murder, George Floyd's lynching. And um, I was called by, I used to write a column for an Italian newspaper, and they called me to, and, and asked me questions about uh, George Floyd's uh, death and the, and the protest. And it occurred to me, and I, and I refused to answer any questions, because the young people in this country were doing a very good job of answering those questions themselves. Um, American outrage has a history of only surviving a couple of days before something else replaces it. But that summer, things went on for a while, and I was really proud of the, this generation. Um, and so it, it, I said it was their turn to speak because they were speaking a lot better than I could. So I'm just going to try to add to to their voices a little bit with this, this one chapter from the trees. Um, and, and I was, something happened for me, and I'll stop when I get to this part, uh, and the, the, that sort of celebrates the idea, that the exchange of ideas. Damon Thruff wrote, wrote with a number three pencil sharpened with his five Beta Kappa pen knife again and again. He scratched out names on a yellow legal pad. He scratched and scratched. Bill Gilmer, Shedrick Thompson, Ed Lang, John Henry James, Charles Wright, Henry Scott, Arthur Young, George Dorsey, Maid Dorsey, Dorothy Malcolm, Eugene Hamilton, Paul Booker, James Jordan, W. W. Watt, Lemuel Walters, George Holden, Will Wilkins, John Ruffin, Henry Ruffin, Eliza Woods, Anderson Goss, Huey Connolly, Dago Pete, Laura Nelson, William Fambro, Isidore Banks, unknown male, Tony Champion, Michael Kelly, Andrew Ford, Henry Henson, unknown male, Charles Willis, William Rawls, Alfred Daniels, Manny Price, 
Robert Scruggs, Jumbo Clark, Jack Long, Henry White, unknown male. Reverend Josh Baskins, Bert Dennis, Andrew McHenry, Stella Young, Abraham Wilson, George Buddington, Albert Martin, unknown male, unknown female, Richard Perrier, John Campbell, John Taylor, Ernest Green, Charles Lang, Ed Johnson, Andrew Clark, Alma Major, Maggie House, Melvin Porter, Johnson Spencer, James Clark, Levy Harrington, Jack Minho, Albert Williams, Will Brown, Wyatt Outlaw, John Stevens, Perry McChristian, Felix Williams, unknown male, Henry Prince, Jim Waters, Frank Livingston, William Miller, Barry Washington, James Cheney, James Jordan, George Armwood, Sidney Randolph, George Taylor, James Carter, Emmett Divers, Smiles Estes, Dick Lundy, Jenny Steers, unknown male, 16 adult men, John Pearson, Frank Morris, <clears throat> James Bird Jr., Albert Young, James Reed, Reeb, <clears throat> excuse me, Fraser B Baker, <clears throat> pardon me, Zachariah Walter, Tom Moss, unknown male, unknown male, Calvin McDowell, Elias Clayton, <clears throat> Elmer Jackson, maybe I could have a sip of water, be great. Elwood Higginbotham, Wade Thomas, Nelson Patton, David Jones, Ephraim Grizzard, Samuel Smith, 11 adult men, Angelo Albano, uh, Ficarato Villarosa, Giuseppe Venturella, Francesco De Fata, Giuseppe De Fata, Giovanni Serrani, Rosario Fiducia, Sanford Lewis, Miles Pfeiffer, Will Temple, Robert Crosby, John Heath, Matthew Williams, and here is where something remarkable happened just a few weeks ago, maybe a month. David Walker, and I received a piece of mail um, from a woman in Tennessee. In my novel, the name that follows David Walker is David Walker's wife. She wrote me and informed me that David's, David Walker's wife was Annie. So I will read David Walker, Annie Walker, David and Annie Walker's four children. George Grant, Raymond Gunn. Well, the fuzz is gone, said Mama Z as she entered the records room. She observed the open dossiers and Thruff's disheveled appearance. Damon looked up. F the FBI lady, Mama Z said. She studied Damon's red eyes on the pages in front of him. What are you doing? I'm writing the names out by hand, Damon sharpened his pencil over a sheet of white paper. Mama Z pulled the pad toward her and looked at the list. Why are you doing this? She asked. When I write the names, they become real, not just statistics. When I write the names, they become real again. It's almost like, like they get a few seconds more here. Do you know what I mean? I would never be able to make up so many names. The names have to be real. They have to be real, don't they? Mama Z put her hand to the side of Damon's face. Why pencil? When I'm done, I'm going to erase every name and set them free. Carry on, child, the old woman said. Thank you. Percival Everett, ladies and gentlemen.
Tie a Miles, all that she carried. Annisfield Wolf Book Award for nonfiction. My great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her it'd be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. Embroidered on a rough-hewn sack, discovered in a pile of fabric remnants, these lines say everything we need to know about the transatlantic slave trade. Simply put, the traffic in human lives separated families, but couldn't destroy the bonds that link generation to generation. In the hands of the brilliant historian Taya Miles, who I'm proud to say is my colleague at Harvard, this simple sack and the words on it open up the richest of meditations on history, wisdom, and love, and how black women's lives can be understood even through the limited resources they were able to refashion with ingenuity and creativity. Miles has summed up her ethic as an historian as follows, and I quote, when I write history, I'm making an unspoken promise to my readers that I will relate what I know about the past and what I can reasonably interpret, interpret as truthfully and as accurately as possible, unquote. <clears throat> As an historian who has focused primarily on the lives of black women and Native Americans, she is more than aware that the historical record is woefully inadequate. There are archival fissures that necessitate the discovery and or establishment of what the historian Marjolene Kars refers to as an alternative archive. Miles' research led her to painstaking reviews of records of slave sales and estate lists, trying to locate a mother and daughter pair with the names of Rose and Ashley. And after considerable effort, eventually she did. It also led her to investigate the history of the objects Rose placed in Ashley's sack as the child was sold away from her mother, the dress, the pecans, and the braid. Together, they forge a material history of wisdom, protection, sustenance, and love and resistance. All that she carried, ladies and gentlemen, is breathtaking in its emotional impact, but it also reveals as Miles' Miles's prodigious gifts as an historian. Out of this humble item, she has produced a magisterial volume on the materials and mechanics of slavery and on African-American resilience and love in the face of enormous, overpowering, destructive forces. Miles is one of the most important figures in African-American history at work today. But it should also be said that she always has her eye on the larger world around us as well. From her development, of an environment, education, and girls' self-esteem building project earlier in her career, to her current work on an environmental history of American girlhood, Miles is keenly attuned to the literal and figurative landscapes that sustain our lives. In fact, one of the features that makes all that she carried so rich and rewarding is that the book places each object, each movement, and each individual in communication with all that surrounds them. Taya Miles is a consummate storyteller whose work in All That She Carried allows us to see, understand, and imagine lives that have too often been dismissed as not knowable. For this signal achievement in historical writing, Taya Miles is the recipient of the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Nonfiction. Ashley Sack, 
really could be taken as a symbol for African American women's history, generally speaking. Because the sack was lost for many years, it was devalued, it was just barely rediscovered, and it turns out that it has tremendous historical worth, tremendous emotional and psychological worth. It means so many things. Most of the artifacts that we do see are, well, I mean, frankly, they're, they're implements of, of abuse and torture. And this was something entirely different, created by enslaved people themselves, which was an artifact shaped out of love, shaped for the purpose of sustaining kin, and especially young women, into the future. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It is quite a view from up here. <laughs> I am so pleased to be here. I'm so grateful to the Cleveland Foundation, to the Ennisfield Wolf Book Prize jurors and staff, to Professor Gates and to my fellow winners and all of you for this moment and for this experience. Thank you so very much. I have to tell you that I'm from Cincinnati and when my plane landed, my mother had a text waiting for me which said, welcome home. So I'm not from Cleveland, but I'm from one of those Ohio sea towns and you know, I have to say that I was struck flying in, looking out at the lake, by how our Ohio sea towns really are going to become the climate refuge cities of the future. So for that reason, too, I appreciate the warmth and welcome that I've experienced during this visit. What I'd like to do in my few minutes up here is to tell you a bit about the book and how I approached it, and then to read a few short passages that I selected, especially for the sewers, the quilters, and the needleworkers in the room, because I understand that uh, some of you got together at, in, in August at the library, and you brought some heirlooms in your family, some textiles, some quilts, and you talked about stories in your family. And it sounds like just a wonderful experience. So these selections are um, especially for you. And then in the last few moments of my time here, I'd like to dwell for just a minute on the question of history and revision and hope. So what I'll say about the project on, a, on the whole, is this was not a book that I planned to write. I had another book planned to write next, which was actually going to be about African Americans in the West and thinking about uh, the Buffalo Soldiers and their families, their wives, their friends, their children, and the larger context of that story. But when I first saw this object that we now call Ashley Sack, hanging in the Washington, D.C. Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, I just felt like my life stood still in that instant. I just felt that I was falling into this object, you know, into this sack, because it was 
at once so beautiful, so haunting, and so emblematic of the experience that black women and black children and enslaved people have had on this land. Somehow, the embroiderer, the sewer, Ruth Middleton, had managed to capture and encapsulate decades, centuries of deep experience and emotion in just a few lines with her needle and thread. And at that moment, I knew that I had to write a book about this sack, even though I wasn't sure how successful such a book might be, in large part because the sack really is the major source, the major piece of evidence that we have about these women. If it were not for that sack that Ruth Middleton embroidered, we wouldn't even know that she or her foremothers, especially her grandmother, had existed. When I tried to piece together documents to identify these women and get a better understanding of the context of their lives, I only found little bits and, little bits and pieces and scraps here and there scattered around the archives of South Carolina. Just little tiny bits and pieces which were incredibly dehumanizing in how they represented these women and other enslaved people. And so the sack became my main source. It became the centerpiece of the book. And in the book, I really endeavored to try to reconstruct and piece together the lives of those women who obtained this old cotton sack, who packed the sack with the items that Dr. Gates read aloud to you in the introduction, and who passed that sack down from mother to daughter to mother to daughter across decades, across four generations, across the landscape of urban South Carolina, rural South Carolina, urban Philadelphia, to the point that today that sack has survived and is now in a museum. So now I will just read a couple of short passages for the sewers here in this beautiful space. Everybody else can listen in too. <laughs> this is from a chapter called Rose's Inventory. And this is a part of the book where I really try to think about the dress that Rose packed for Ashley into that sack when she knew her daughter was being sold away from her. A tattered dress appears first in Ruth's embroidered catalog. This placement should give the object weight for us. It hints that the dress was the first thing packed, or the first thing recalled, or the main thing highlighted in this family's sad separation saga. The list in its order presages, perhaps, a personal trait of Ruth, the sewer, who gained public notice for her stylish attire in Philadelphia. Whether or not Rose packed the dress first, it is clear from the list that Rose thought immediately about the problem, of the problem of clothing Ashley. Rose knew, as did many women ensnared by slavery, that apparel is simultaneously material and social. By providing Ashley with the dress, worn and frayed as it may have been, Rose insisted on Ashley's right to bodily protection and feminine dignity, while also emphasizing the relationship between them. A tattered dress was a thousand things to Rose and her figurative sisters in slavery. Protection, honor, artistry, memory, and connection. In our hands and imaginations, a garment like the dress Rose gave Ashley might index social relational worlds cross-cut by the intricate weaves of race, gender, and status. And now I want to share just a final comment about history revision and hope. Of course, history took place in the past, and we can't change the past. We can't even know the past perfectly or fully, because all we have are bits of evidence with which to reconstruct it.
our interpretations of history, our interpretations of history can and should change based on new evidence or new context or new callings, what we feel is important in our moment. And I wanted to share with you that I received an email from a reader which has changed one of my interpretations in the book. This came from a reader who lives in Kansas, and uh, she sent me a letter in the mail. And in the letter, she said she just finished reading the book, and she said that tatting is a way of knotting thread that was very popular. She wrote, in essence, tatting is durable handmade lace. I know about this from my grandmother, who was born in 1903, and I have pieces of her tatting and my great-grandmother's tatting. And she goes on to explain to me in this letter that the way to describe something that had this durable lace was by using the word tatted. And she said sometimes people misspoke and called it tattered. So now I have this wonderful thought that was gifted by a reader, which is that that dress perhaps was not frayed and ragged. Maybe it was embellished by this durable, beautiful lace, which is just another example of black women's artistry and hope. Thank you so much. Ty Miles, ladies and gentlemen. I received the Annisfield Book Award in 1988. I'd never heard of it. Um, it's got a letter in the mail, I got a check, so I thought it was a pretty cool prize. <laughs> and I looked it up, did a little research, and I said, wow, this is a heck of a, a, heck of a prize. So Arnold Hurston was on the Saturday Review of Literature when she won for Dust Tracks on a Road, her autobiography. Martin Luther King um, won this prize. Langston Hughes won this prize. I was like, wow, this is a great prize. And a year later, I was invited by the chair of the jury, Ashley Montague, the, the famous social scientist of Princeton, if I would join the board with Gwendolyn Brooks. And um, so the three of us were on this board. We never, basically, we each got to pick one, <laughs> one winner. That's how it worked. Um, then when Ashley transitioned, I was invited by the Cleveland Foundation to um, become the chair of the jury and reconstitute the prize. This was uh, a gem, a hidden gem in the history of Cleveland, in the history of arts and letters in the history of cultural diversity that, you know, the, the Cleveland was burying its light under a bushel basket. And what my job was, was to lift that uh, bushel basket off and let it shine. And the person I did it with is here, Mary Louise Hahn, for the first 14 years. Please stand up. Stand up, Mary Louise. Stand up. Give it up for Mary Louise. Mary Louise threw me a kiss, but you know, that give, caused me, might give me COVID, so I can't. <laughs> Ty almost wouldn't let me hug her. She goes, no, nah, no, nah, you get that COVID hug. <laughs> no, nah, but we all got to be careful, yeah, because it's, um, it's still, we're still in danger. Though I was boosted on Sunday and got my, you know, it's so funny. I walked into CVS and, and <laughs> Nurse said, I can give you two shots. I can give you the I go, two shots? <laughs> it was hard enough to get me in here for one shot, let alone two shots. But, um, but I did it. George McCary of Fear and Strangers, A History of Xenophobia, the winner of the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Nonfiction. In 2016, Dictionary.com named the word xenophobia the word of the year. 
in a US-centric context, this of course makes sense to all of us here this evening. The rise of white supremacy that we're seeing in the United States isn't new, certainly, but goes back vividly in recent memory to the presidential election, sadly, of 2016. But that makes us stop for a moment. Donald Trump's horrific remarks about Mexicans came at the declaration of his candidacy in 2015. And his Muslim ban, quote unquote, one of the most vivid examples of, of American xenophobia, was enacted in 2017, neither in 2016. Trump's rhetorical demonization of any number of others picked up steam as his presidency moved forward. 2016 wasn't the banner year for it. It turns out that the word was selected largely by dictionary.com editors because of the spike in its lookups in the year 2016, owing to three non-United States causes. The Brexit vote, the Syrian refugee, refugee crisis, and attacks on foreign workers in South Africa. All this is to say that xenophobia, ladies and gentlemen, is not a uniquely American condition, but rather one that besets and harms people in every country, unfortunately, on every continent. But it also must be noted, and this is where Dr. George McCary, a psychiatrist and an historian, comes in that it is a uniquely modern concept. Yes, there's been um, hatred of strangers since time immemorial. One need only look at any ancient text from any ancient tradition to see that warring between rivals often re revealed strains of loathing, of difference, and foreignness. With its Greek linguistic roots, the term Xenophobia was coined in the 1880s alongside the naming of other phobias, interestingly enough. Phobias of water, of going outside, of being inside, of many things. The invention of xenophobia took place in a culture that was becoming increasingly medicalized. And to use a word with which we're familiar now, increasingly globalized. Originally referring to nationalism gone utterly mad, quote unquote, in European nations that expelled groups because of their foreign origin or religious difference, in 1899, xenophobia flipped to connote its opposite in meaning. Pegged to Chinese resistance to imperial domination in the Boxer Rebellion, the term commonly came to be ascribed to the colonized, who dared to express sentiments against or resistance to their colonizers. Isn't that ironic? I have to say that this uh, was a surprising usage, to me at least, and reminded me of nothing so much as white supremacists representing themselves as the besieged and the bullied. <laughs> it, you can clap at that, because it is ironic. <laughs> It wasn't the colonized, as it turned out, who were calling themselves xenophobic. As much of Europe embraced increasingly virulent forms of nationalism, culminating in the Holocaust and World War II, the term xenophobia flipped back again to refer primarily to those in more powerful positions who could use their hatred of the other to control the other. In a national landscape, xenophobia originally diagnosed as an individual pathology, takes on collective proportions when propaganda, earlier in the 20th century, and social media today, amplify stereotypes, differences, and foreignness as threats. For George McCary, xenophobia is not a matter of only history or only psychiatry. It has its roots in both. As the cultural historian Sandra Gilman suggests in his review of George's book, xenophobia is quote unquote, an ever shifting quality of mind. What historians do best, Gilman continues, is to constantly imagine not only our world, but also how we know our world, and thus how those in our world know us. Isn't that a beautiful way to describe what Taya does and what George does as historians? A fear and strangers, in A Fear and Strangers, McCary helps us 
toward this kind of all-encompassing and, I hope, healing imagination. George McCary is the recipient of this year's Annis Field Wolf Book Award for Nonfiction. In the early 20th century, people felt the need to name an irrational fear of strangers. And that need then allowed for a kind of series of thinkers and of uh, activists to claim that this was an ethical failure, a, a failure of tolerance, a failure of equality. I didn't want to not bring into this story the fact that I was the son of immigrants, that I in fact had witnessed from afar the, my parents' country blow up into a brutal civil war where neighbors were suddenly turned into enemies and the kind of xenophobia that I was trying to expand from this narrow definition about immigrants to a broader kind of fear and hatred of strangers uh, was very much at play and uh, nearly brought the country to utter destruction. Thank you so much. Uh, it, this is a, a, a startling honor for me, and uh, it began by my literally being startled. You see, I was taking a power nap, um, and I, li I like to call it a power nap because that sounds like you're not being lazy. Uh, and my cell phone buzzed, and I looked down, and it said, Henry Louis Gates. And I, oddly, Bizarrely, I exclaimed to precisely nobody, because no one else was in the room, I have to take this. <laughs> so then I hear this mellifluous voice, George, this is Henry Louis Gates. I'm like, I've heard that voice. This is the great Henry Louis Gates. And before another word is spoken, I'm running scenarios about why he is calling me. And I'm running scenarios, and I get it. Oh my Lord, I'm gonna be on TV. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe his team went all the way to Beirut to find my roots. I mean, <laughs> they're amazing. Well, then I discovered that the real reason for the call, the Annisfield Wolf Nonfiction Book Prize, and I was very elated. So my gratitude to Professor Gates and the amazing, amazing panel of judges, the, the wonderful Karen Long and the Cleveland Foundation. I, I need to mention one of my mentors, the late Michael S. Harper, and thanks to my agents and editors, my colleagues, and especially my family, whose love has been the kind of buttress for the work that I've done. Thank you especially to my wife, Arabella, who's here. Professor Gates then told me a little about this very distinguished award, uh, which he said used to be considered the Black Pulitzer Prize, so uh, all the Pulitzer Prizes started going to black folks. Uh, and and uh, he, he, he also teased me and joked that I was the diversity winner. <laughs> so after perusing the, the august list of winners, I must admit, it's quite intimidating, and I wondered if I was out of place. However, as I delved deeper into the 87-year history of this award, I couldn't help but feel a little more at ease, a little more at home. You see, my parents, my scientist father, came to these shores in pursuit of microscopic mysteries, and he brought along with him my mother, who at the time spoke only French and Arabic. They gave me so much, but neither of them could ready me for America. You see, I was always the diversity kid in my Sopranos Jersey town. 
to find out what was going on around me. I didn't realize that until I watched The Sopranos. <laughs> and uh, it much less what was outside my suburbs, suburb. Like so many newcomers to this country, I counted on a library. I read and I read and I read. So when I examined the stunning list of Anisfield Wolf winners, I found many people I considered old friends, many whose words changed me. First and foremost, Ralph Ellison, but also Derek Walcott and Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. The psychiatrist, Robert Coles, whose children of crisis encouraged me at a pivotal point in my life to believe I could be a writer and a psychiatrist and Edward Said, whose work helped me to consider my identity as a Lebanese American. These and other winners were my, and I would go further and say, many of America's critical moral educators. Many were themselves diversity candidates who were granted different lines of sight due to their own, at times peripheral, experiences. I'm someone for whom the periphery has been home, a doctor among writers, a historian amongst psychiatrists, a humanist who somehow snuck into the temple of science, a medical school, and an Arab American. Now there are advantages to being on the outside. Innovation, moral clarity, often that comes from the outside. That comes from hybridization and synthesis, the outside grabbing and reforming what is in. However, there are costs, and the costs can be huge. They can be cruel. They can be murderous, especially when what is diverse and different becomes loathed and degraded, dehumanized or demonized. A Fear in Strangers was my attempt to examine those deadly transformations. I'm going to read a little bit from the end of the book. To set it up, let me um, say just a few words. I'd finished the, the core of the book, and I was in uh, the small village where my wife grew up in the Pyrenees. It's between, on the edge of France and Spain. And as I finished the book, I thought, and it seems quite appropriate for me to read this in this beautiful space today, my mind turned to Walter Benjamin, the German Jewish writer, who on September 25, 1940, sought to escape the Nazis by traversing a mountain path just a few miles down from our house. Benjamin was sickly, and when the smuggler and three others joined him, he was lugging a heavy briefcase. The others told him it was crazy, insane, it was a hard mountain pass, and his valise needed to be abandoned. He solemnly told them that the manuscript inside was more important than his own life. So they all agreed to take turns lugging his bag. When the little troop made it to the border, they discovered the Spanish had suddenly reversed their prior policies. Instead of letting them pass, they were all arrested. Walter Benjamin committed suicide that night. His briefcase was never found. The story of Walter Benjamin's flight is famous, and it has long haunted me. Did this brilliant wanderer, this European flaneur, know that in the end he would become mythic as a man on the run, a Zenos turned away, crushed by cool legalisms enforced at foreign ports and borders? And what of his briefcase? What was in it? Many have speculated, but I think the simplest answer is hope. That leather bag contained Walter Benjamin's last appeal. It was what remained of a trembling, failing trust that perhaps his voice might vault over the highest walls of hatred to reach far off, perhaps quite foreign beings who might join with him over those pages. Sometimes I imagine that if one stumbled upon that dusty valise and pried it open as in A Thousand and One Nights, it would release the roaring voices of history's refugees and exiles, all their lamentations and laughter and their stories, all their accusations and confessions, all freed from oblivion together in a waterfall of sound so grand, so sublime, that for an instant it would stop everything, even time. History is a trip into the spirit world. 
It is an attempt to wake the graveyard and give our ancestors voice and form so that we can confront them and free ourselves from their spells. History, at its best then, entails the hope not only for resurrection, but of exorcism. It holds the desire that by remembering, we will not repeat. Of fear and strangers has been my attempt to remember for myself, for you. We have a name for what is happening to us, what has been growing in scope, flashing red, spreading. The only questions are how extreme will it become? What forms will it take? Who will it target? And who will stand to oppose it? This hatred will not end of its own accord. This is our catastrophe. That poet who once grilled me about my history, himself descended from enslaved people, wrote that, quote, nightmare begins responsibility. That responsibility, I know now, to ourselves, to each other, is not just to wake up, but to remember it all when we do. Thank you. George McCary, ladies and gentlemen. Beginning a tribute to Ishmael Reed on the occasion of his receiving the Annis Field Wolf Lifetime Achievement Award with a quote from a 2006 New York Times review of his collected poems is an irony that likely won't escape him. And I quote, Reed is the most American of American writers, if by American we mean a quality defined by its indefinability and its perpetual transformations as new ideas, influences, and traditions enter our cultural conversation, unquote. In my mind, I imagine Reed's response when he read this, is that what we mean by American? And who is this we? No one asked me. <laughs> I number myself, ladies and gentlemen, among that we who have been looking at Ishmael Reed for a very long time, in my case, almost 50 years, and looking to Ishmael Reed's works for guidance as we, as we wade through the complexities and the sheer absurdities of American life. His 1972 novel, Mumbo Jumbo, was central to my book, The Signifying Monkey, my own breakthrough as a scholar and a cultural critic. Scribner's will bring out a 50th anniversary edition of this novel in November, an honor that suggests that Reed himself is something of a cultural institution. And what has brought him to this status? Nothing less than his unmatched gift for sending up, skewering, and challenging the power of cultural institutions including, to name just a few, the New York Times, the National Book Awards, Broadway, and perhaps even the chair of a certain literary awards jury, <laughs> to name just a few. I hope this grand irony doesn't keep him up at night. I say from the heart that this man deserves adulation. Born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, raised in Buffalo, schooled as an artist in New York City, and now established for over 40 years as a writer, publisher, community leader, working out of his home in Oakland, California, with his wonderful, brilliant wife, Carla. Ishmael Reed has written 12 novels, nine books of essays, 11 plays, and hundreds and hundreds of poems. In fact, his newest play, called The Conductor, will be performed uh, between October 13th and 16th in live virtual readings hosted by the theater for New York, uh, for the new city. His output is remarkable and seemingly endless. American literature, art, music, and politics 
continued to give him ample fodder for his work. He's become quite visible in the past few years as a playwright, with 2019's The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda, last year's The Slave Who Loved Caviar, and the upcoming The Conductor. Last year, he published the novel The Terrible Fours, the third novel in a series begun in the 1980s. He is a prolific contributor to numerous publications, including Counterpunch, Alta, Tablet, and the journal he edits with his daughter, Tennessee, Concha Magazine. The recipient of dozens of major awards, including a MacArthur Genius Grant, a Guggenheim, and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, Reed has founded an important award of his own to counter what he saw as the limitations and prescriptiveness of the National Book Awards. He established the Before Columbus Foundation in 1976, which has sponsored the American Book Awards since 1980 with the following mandate, and I quote, we welcome a time in history when America, quote unquote, is no longer interchangeable with rudeness, grossness, and provincialism, but has begun to stand for a society where all of the cultures of the world may coexist and in which cultural exchange is allowed to thrive, unquote. When the New Yorker writer who is with us this evening, Julian Lucas, asked him last year to describe his legacy, Ishmael Reed responded, quote, I made American literature more democratic for writers from different backgrounds, unquote. And he did. There is no pretension Reed leaves unpricked. No prejudice he allows to stand. No cultural force he fears. He's always ready to punch up, to hobble institutions that grow too comfortable with their own power. He grows suspicious of movements that profess revolution, but leave themselves open to the embrace of corporate, corporatization. As Julian Lucas wrote in his tremendous New Yorker profile last year, and I quote, he's unimpressed by the recent Black Lives Matter inspired wave of interest in anti-racist writing, anti-racist reading, which he dismisses as hyper-focused on life coaching books about how to get along with black people. <laughs> that latter, the last 10 words there from Israel. <laughs> Julian continues, anti-racism, he said, quote, quoting Ishmael, is the new yoga. <laughs> Uh, what reading is about remind, remember the Richard Pryor album, uh, Glenda Carpio, my good friend and colleague, uh, is here, and she wrote a brilliant book on the history of black humor, and she has a great chapter on Richard Pryor. Remember the album when Richard Pryor's dressed like a monk from the um, Middle Ages, and he's at the stake, and the fire's coming up, he's tied to a stake, and the caption is, was it something I said? <laughs> That's Ishmael Reed. Of great satirists, ladies and gentlemen, it's often said that nothing is sacred. Not so for Israel Reed. Sacred to him is clearing out, clearing out sanctimony, clearing out posturing, to create a cultural space for the free expression of all voices. For his forever commitment to bringing down the bullies, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter how big they are. Ishmael Reed, it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to announce, is the recipient of the 2022 Annisfield Wolf Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> well, I started out reading fairy tales. I would get them from the uh, library and secondhand bookstore and I spent hours in my room reading fairy tales. It took my mind away from my condition. You know, we were living in the projects, and uh, reading them, I was thinking to myself, you know, these kingdoms and dragons, you know, just stirred my imagination. So I'm writing fairy tales again, so I say I'm going into my second childhood. I wrote, uh, like, uh, The Fool Who Thought Too Much is like a fairy tale, which is reminiscent of the kind of stories I used to read, the Grimm Brothers and all of those. That I left New York was because uh, I, was not, I was always uh, 
suspicious of people who are flattering me. I said, if I'd remained in New York, I would have died of an overdose of affection because New York has that old European attitude toward the artist that the artist is special. Excuse me. You know, I was thinking about this white supremacy thing. <clears throat> I wrote an article recently where I said that uh, since the two major white supremacist movements are headed by Hispanics, <laughs> white supremacy must be running out of Aryans. <laughs> I, I think. <clears throat> I think they must have, they made this guy who's uh, President Hungary a uh, white supremacist. Anyway, uh, Skip calls this award the Black Pulitzer Prize. This is appropriate because of, it's black people who brought me here. It all began when my partner, Carla Blank, and I moved from an upper middle class neighborhood to a zone in Oakland that is variously called the inner city the ghetto, or urban. Film and television producers have made a fortune from the kind of cliche scenes from our neighborhood. Typical is one which shows a group of black teenagers selling drugs on a corner. The police pull up and they disperse. We've seen that a thousand times. Even the New York Times whose coverage, like that of other media, hasn't changed in over 100 years, and that editorial page is, has less diversity than Mississippi, <laughs> have declared such scenes to be uh, part of an exhausted genre. My experience is that of growing up in Buffalo Projects and living in what was, until recently, a 98% black neighborhood since 1979. So it's quite different from what you see on TV. Joyce had his Dublin. James Farrell had his Chicago. I have written extensively about 53rd Street in Oakland, whose cross street is Genoa. It was formerly an Italian neighborhood. In 1979, Carl and I bought a Queen Anne Victorian house, which was in bad need of repairs. It rained in the living room, and pigeons had taken over the roof and the window sills. It was built in 1906. Our reception in this neighborhood ranged from chilly to hostile. There was one, at least one attempt at a home invasion. We were viewed as intruders. The patriarchs who controlled the street subjected me to an interview. I think that I failed. <laughs> Though patriarchs are getting a bad name these days, when the ones on my street died, the gangs took over. When I returned from teaching at Harvard, my house sitter said that a crack operation had begun across the street from my house. This is when the neighborhood, some of whom had shunned us, looked on to us for leadership. The maroon uh, communities that resisted Spanish and French control had their own leaders. So I declared myself the Zydeco King. <laughs> Small K, okay. And began to fight to rid our neighborhood of this menace. These urban centers are maroon. They don't get the services that are available to white neighborhoods. They're on their own, marooned. Some, for, some Oakland, or for some neighborhoods in the Oakland Hills, 
All one had to do was to call the police to get rid of trouble. The police came to our neighborhoods to collect bribes from the drug dealers. And though the face of urban crime in the media is black, the major drug dealers on our block were Chinese. The drugs were coming from Chinatown. One of the uh, dealers was murdered and his brother was seriously injured during a shootout. These shootouts were regular occasions on our block. When Tennessee was a child, we had her sleep in the kitchen because shootouts usually occurred on the first of the month when people got their checks. When the Tennessee was older, she joined me when I attended meetings with the police who were always making excuses about how they couldn't solve our problems. It was a result of a community liaison officer attached to the place, of the police, that we got rid of a crack house. We got it torn down. It took a felon, finally, a felon who'd been released from maximum security prison, Pelican Bay, to end the drug merchandising on our street. He challenged a Chinese mob that threatened to take over a house that he inherited. They backed down. He sold the house for $166,000. A developer brought in a Chinese-speaking crew who flipped the house. They sold it for $800,000, which was the beginning of the regentrification of the block. Now we got plenty of police protection now. <laughs> That brought in white residents who got out of their way to avoid speaking to us. Our black neighborhood had become a family. Unlike the new arrivals, Carla gets along with people all over the world. She directed my play in China. She put together a Chinese cast that spoke these long monologues in English uh, in a few days, and then she directed a play in, <clears throat> excuse me, Ramallah which included uh, Syrians and Syrian and Palestinian actors. As a matter of fact, I went to an international poetry uh, conference in uh, Jerusalem, and the great Israeli poet, the late Nathan Zaks, he said, it's really great and brave of you to come here to Israel under these conditions. I said, this is a vacation. We get all the gunfire we need on our block. <laughs> When our next door neighbor was ill, Carla was her caretaker. When she died, Carla gathered flowers for her garden and sent them to, the pres to be present at her funeral held in Pasadena. One day, two black women knocked on the door. It was her sisters who had come to thank Carla. My experience in this inner city neighborhood inspired nonfiction, a play, articles, poetry, and even a song, which was recorded by Robert Jason and composed by Carmen Moore. Robert Jason did Aida on Broadway. The gospel got me, the gospel got me in trouble. Because I say, why don't I use the African religion as an interpretation of the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? You know, Jesus said, I, and the least of these. So at the end of the play, when Judas is asked to identify Jesus, he kisses everybody on the stage <laughs> because they were possessed by the spirit of Jesus. And so I earned some of the money I invested in the play by arguing with theologians at places like the Theological Seminary and other places. Strange play. But anyway, as for the elders who were suspicious of us when we moved into the block, I did most of their eulogies, which got me to reading the scriptures. Again, if critics think that I am an angry person, they haven't read Acts or Proverbs. <laughs> Thank you for this award. Okay, right here?
Ladies and gentlemen, Ishmael Reed. Good evening. As um, Dr. Gates mentioned, I'm Karen Long, and I work on the Ennisfield Wolf Book Awards with you all. And with you all, and with these writers, we have made a sacred space tonight. I want to acknowledge the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose lands we stand on, and the thousands of Native American people representing more than 100 tribes who live in Northeast Ohio today. I would also like to acknowledge the many people who made this ceremony possible. Edith Annisfield Wolf, of course, the reason we are here. She understood that words and ideas change the way we think and act. I also want to thank Ron Richard for his and the Cleveland Foundation's steadfast support of these prizes. And the longtime jury leader, Skip Gates, who has made sure that more readers each year find the best books to enlarge our civic spaces and civic hearts. Happy birthday tomorrow, Dr. Gates. And finally, I would like to express my gratitude to the many partners who have made this ceremony and this year's Cleveland Book Week possible. Book Week continues through the weekend. Tomorrow you can see more of Ishmael Reed or George Macari or Annisfield Wolf poet Victoria Chang. Visit our website, annisfield-wolf.org, to see the full lineup. There's also a podcast you can listen to called The Asterix. And for those who have relished the Annisfield Wolf documentary these past two years, the one-hour program featuring this year's recipients debuts on Ideastream November 3rd. Clips from the documentary were sprinkled throughout our ceremony, offering a taste of this year's outstanding production. I hope you tune in for the full show. As we wrap up the ceremony, please continue the celebration with us as we host a book signing here at the Maltz, as well as a reception at the ballroom at Park Lane, which is catty corner across 105th Street. We have lighting and musicians to guide your way. If you would like to purchase a book and have it signed, please join the line for book sales and the signing backstage at the Toby Devon Lewis Grand Corridor before you make your way to the Park Lane. But first, I would like to invite this year's honorees to join us on stage one last time. Please come up, Percival Everett, whose genre-bending work Please come up, Percival Everett, whose genre-bending work conjures a supernational reckoning with the murderous facts of our history. Please join us on stage, Danica Kelly, whose poetry contains art's power to transfigure and heal. Come forward, George Macari, who weaves history, philosophy, and psychology to explore how we know and misknow one another and Taya Miles, whose research recovers priceless histories that illuminate what society tried to erase. You're here. And our Lifetime Achievement honoree, Ishmael Reed, whose creativity transcends mediums and cultures and decades, inspiring generations of artists. Please do rise. Writers, readers, we have poetry in the house tonight. Thank you, and good night. Bravo. Bravo.